Hello, handicapped woman. Hi. <laughs> we'll talk about how this happened later. <laughs> it's so awkward to drive with because I just sit with my arm on the thing and I look like I'm waving at everybody, just like. <laughs> what to do with you, huh? Huh? I said, what, what are we going to do with you? So I don't know. I don't know. I'll be the mascot your, now. Of course, it's your right hand, right? So and you're not left-handed. Of handed. course. You know, it couldn't be the the one I don't use every single day, but I'm getting real good at being amb ambidextrous. Now we know what it takes. So we're going to cross our fingers that the debacle that happened with my internet connection on Thursday does not happen tonight. Hmm. I know. I don't know. I was pretty entertained. That was pretty funny. Oh my God. Logged me back in. I was like, man, this is like really bad. <laughs> All right. So we're recording tonight. Just an FYI on that. Hey, Laura, that referral you gave me for the uh, yard guy worked out. I really it did? It. It did. Nice. That's really great to know. Thanks, Zach. I appreciate yeah. the update. Yeah, Hi, very Jordy. punctual and, and really friendly and, and just he's doing a great job. Awesome. I'm very happy to hear that. I really am because I've had a, a really difficult time with people like laborers and subcontractors and um, in general. So thank you. You got it. Yeah. So we're going to let a bunch of people in right now and then we're going to move on to the meeting in just a short while. This is a very, very, very special meeting tonight. Honestly, um, one of my favorite mm, opportunities would be for Paul to present. And then the fact that it's our August um, birthday anniversary, 30 years of the chapter is really, really special. And um, I'm just very grateful that we We've come here like to this night and in my mind, it's been in my mind, you know, it's been in my mind, like this whole year, like August, like devote the month to our 30th chapter anniversary. And what does that mean to us? And to bring it home and have Paul um, actually presenting tonight, it, it means a lot to me um, and to the chapter in, in general. And I feel like, um, it's just so significant and meaningful to have him have um, this opportunity to then share everything that he's been doing, all the hard work and, um, you know, just be able to talk about it uh, a little bit more in depth because, you know, we all know he has the Ventura River um, website and he's a mad blogger and, you know, he's going to give us the information and the data um, as far as updates and that's all really good stuff, but to share it with us tonight, I think is really important and I'm looking forward to it. And I honestly, um, I'm gonna start in just a few minutes to give Paul the amount of time that he needs to talk about his updates about Surfers Point Managed Retreat. And, you know, the Matilla Haddam removal is, um, you know, very significantly moving forward, which is uh, in, in steps that are beyond bureaucracy and, uh, you know, grant funding and all that. So um, I want to give Paul as much time as possible. Is that a ponytail I see, Sir Jenkin? No? Okay. All right. So I want to give Paul as much time as possible. So we're going to do, we're going to start pretty soon and we'll do some updates uh, as far as like what's happening with the chapter uh, events this month since it's our official 30th anniversary chapter birth month. Um, there's some really wonderful things going on and I'm looking forward to um, being able to share that with you guys tonight. So we're not going to wait too much longer, maybe like a minute or two, and then we'll move forward into um, the rest of the meeting. And uh, I can't think of anything else. So, you know, honestly, if you guys don't subscribe to the newsletter, I get the feeling you guys all do right now. I I've, I've see everybody's names on the zoom meeting and um maybe jordy's new jordy this way on my brady bunch um like profile thing jordy's our new uh cal state cal state channel islands intern so he's going to be working with us 
this uh, semester, which we're very grateful for. He's checked in on the meeting tonight. And um, one of the really cool things about the newsletter is that it gives you a really broad overview of everything we're doing. And it's kind of, uh, you know, kind of updates us with volunteer opportunities and program um, activities and that what events are coming up. And John Stith actually like knocked it out of the park this month. John's here. And uh, Jordy, if you don't get the newsletter, I would suggest that you act, you sign up for it because um, there's a, I think on our website, um, on our website, there's a, a place to see the past issues. And uh, this, this one is John's, in my opinion, like really extraordinary uh, documentation of what we've been up to and, um, and, and really represented us very well. So thank you, John. I know you're out there and you're. Thank you. Yeah, it was exceptional too. I loved it. Yeah, yeah. I, look forward, I look forward to working with you guys. I just uh, hit the link uh, and subscribed. So I really appreciate that. You guys made that very easily. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah. John does a great job every month, but this month was a really wonderful, uh, remarkable retrospective of the work that we've been doing. So I think we're going to get started. And then um, everybody that comes on in, we can just um, include them as we go. Um, I did want to give a few updates, again, plagiarizing off the newsletter. So if you've subscribed to it, you already know this stuff. Um, we have volunteer opportunities right now. Um, Hold on to your butt program is looking for some volunteers. Our ocean friendly restaurant programs looking for volunteers. Rise Above Plastics, Ocean Friendly Gardens. I run that program and it just seems like we have some things we really need to um, focus on and we just are really short on uh, the bandwidth of uh, volunteerism to actually coordinate those things. Not labor, but actually like moving forward with certain projects would be wonderful if we could get some more volunteers for that. So a couple other things coming up is that uh, this Saturday on the 14th, we have a cleanup on the Nature Conservancy property uh, at Ormond Beach in Oxnard from nine to 12. It's um, uh, on, well, that clearly I just was reading the event on Facebook. I put the wrong date on there. So I will clean that up. And then um, unfortunately, um, the, I was at the Nature Conservancy property today and it's a mess. So I really look forward to some volunteers being able to help us um, eradicate some of that trash. It's homeless, homeless camp trash, but, and it's just ongoing and it's frightening. And the waterways are right there that lead to Ormond Lagoon, leads to the ocean. So I'm looking forward to that day when we don't have to deal with it anymore, but in, in, right now we do. I'm sorry, and you said that was uh, Saturday the 14th, yes. 9 and 12, and what beach was that? I'm sorry. It's the Nature Conservancy property at Ormond Beach in Oxnard. Laura, is it the 7th or the 14th? Oh, I apologize. It's the 7th. Thank you, Joan. I had the 14th on my mind because we have another cleanup on the 14th, but yes, it's the 7th. Thank you. So good thing Joan's listening because I actually did it right. And then uh, so on the 28th, we have the Wild and Scenic Film Festival that we're tabling at with the Ventura Land Trust, which is a really cool event. That's uh, on the Facebook um, platform as well. We're tabling and there's lots of great merch and opportunities to be able to, to just check in and say hi. We uh, look forward to seeing you guys. It's the it's the first in-person uh, film festival since before COVID and it's a wonderful event. It really is, it's a fundraiser for them and it's really special. I appreciate them um, offering this, the opportunity to table uh, at, at the event itself. And then in September, our first Tuesday of the month chapter meeting will be in person, barring any unforeseen COVID um, setbacks at Patagonia which is in, Ox, in uh, Ventura on Santa Clara, their retail outlet, if we remember where that is. It's been a, over a year and a half, but um, looking forward to it. We, as usual, in partnership with Patagonia 
have a justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion policy where we really want to welcome diversity to our chapter and to our chapter meetings. And Patagonia stands behind us with that. So um, looking forward into the future, hopefully we will be able to expand that policy and that uh, outreach as well. Um, we are looking for core volunteers to um, contribute to certain types of um, opportunities like event planning. We have an executive committee uh, opening coming up with the volunteer coordinator position, which I would be looking forward to speaking to anyone that wants to do that. And um, again, you can find more information about all those opportunities in our newsletter. On August the 21st from 6 to 10 at Topa Topa on Colt Street in Ventura is our actual 30th anniversary birthday party, which is very exciting. And Topa's a really gracious host there, looking forward to um, celebrating with us. And so we hope that you guys can come out and um, just say hi, which would be amazing. Um, we are looking forward to another 30 years um, in my lifetime, <laughs> for sure. And, uh, and it's a really wonderful opportunity to just check in and say hi and celebrate. And um, we have a really great retrospective in the newsletter this month that shows you guys our accomplishments and the people that stand behind that. And so... Um, the Ventura chapter of the Surfrider Foundation was formed in 1991, 30 years ago, by a small group of surfers concerned about declining coastal water quality and uh, new engineering proposals that, if implemented, would forever alter our coast. Chapter activists joined together to protest in the construction of projects, including a seawall, that would run the length of Surfers Point, alterations to the jetty and the dredge, and a new jetty south of the Ventura Harbor. And if I remember correctly, Paul told me that they wanted to concrete the Ventura River. If, is that true, Paul? Is that something that, in yep. my memory? Yeah, that was something that happened early in the chapter two. Yeah, and so Paul's been there since pretty much the beginning. I, I asked Larry Manson to reach back in his memory to tell me roughly when you started and he and Delia thought maybe it was uh, 93 to 95, something like that. So Paul goes back forever. And I promised myself I would not cry. So I'm not going to cry. So I'm going to, can you guys all see this? No, yeah. Yes. What are you trying to show us? <laughs> I'm trying to show you this slide. Uh, you have to go down to the very middle between <laughs> the chat and record and hit share screen. It's a yeah. green button. Okay, wait, hold on. This is great. This gives me a chance not to cry. Okay, so tell me again, share screen. Oh, yeah, click share screen. Okay. Then it should share your screen. Oh, okay, perfect. All right, I'll probably cry now. I'm still this, oh, there you go. All right. This is it. So you guys are going to get the best I can give you. All right. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> how do I begin? The fact that I could not find a lot of pictures of Paul in print after so many years tells us just how much of a behind the scenes, head down, focused, hard worker he is. He has been there since the beginning and is one of the chapters, if not the foundation's biggest cheerleaders. And we are his. He is without a doubt, our hero of the coast. If you look at the B BC Reporter cover where it says local heroes, Paul's it for us, 100%. Surfers Point Manager Treat Engineering and Execution Lead, Matilla Hadam Coalition and Dam Removal Lead, Surfers Point Restoration League, VenturaRiver.org website founder and mad blogger, right? I am really, really happy to introduce Paul Jenkins as our featured guest speaker tonight. And Paul, we love you so much. Oh. 
And so how do I exit out of this? Uh, just click on the share screen and then okay. somehow, somehow you're going to have to um, I can't uh, give you then you're going to have to give me permission to share okay. my stop share. All right, so share now. No. Yes. So no. Now what? So I want to now. So, yeah, I see so I'm going to make you. Know, I need to make you a co-host. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. So that was briefly tearing for me. That was pretty good. And we love you so much. We really do. We could not do this without you. A hundred, two hundred percent. So did I do it? There, you co-host. Let me see. Yes, that's going to work. All right. Um. Wow, what can I say? Thank you, Laura. Um, yeah, it's been it's been a long road. And if you look at the that little section of the newsletter that we put in the newsletter, the old shredder from the early '90s was classic. And some of these guys who started this chapter were just classic. And I do have a presentation on the history of the chapter, but we're not doing that tonight. But um, uh, oh my God, I mean, they, they were out there uh, in their wetsuits and surfboards blocking the tractors and protesting the, the construction of the South Jetty and the, the new South Jetty and, and the spur groin at Pierpont and uh, started the Blue Water Task Force and just really started ramping up public education around the coast. And, and uh, I came in around uh, 1994, towards the end of 94, um, which is when a friend of mine who was running the beach cleanups, an engineer friend of mine that I used to work with, um, uh, said, hey, you should come out and come to a chapter meeting. So I did. And I think I told everyone, hey, look, I I'm an ocean engineer and I'm worried about this erosion problem. And they're like, oh, you're our man. <laughs> so that's... Uh, that's what happened. And that's kind of the way it works with Surfrider. If you've got a passion and you're into something, then Surfrider can give you the, the platform to, um, you know, be able to develop that, that program. And I, today I'm going to share with you, um, uh, really just looking at the Ventura ecosystem blog. So I'm going to see if this, um, screen will share. Uh, Yay. Okay, so you guys see this part of the screen now, right? Yep. Okay, I'm not an expert Zoomer either. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, you know, when, when, when we set up this Ventura River ecosystem thing, um, you know, those a lot of well, ecosystem's kind of a big word that nobody really knows what it means, but there was actually a grant funding out there for uh, ecosystem-based management is, is what, you know, uh, a bunch of scientists finally recognized that, you know, gee, everything's connected and uh, it's impossible to, um, you know, fix one thing without fixing the whole system because you know everything trickles downstream so to speak uh, and that works on the rivers and the beaches and um, so uh, I started working on over here you can see under ecosystem based management there's there's you know basically four different categories for coastal management the dam uh, urban green infrastructure and and watershed management understanding that, we have to manage the watershed as a system uh, to support and benefit and restore our coast. Um, and so uh, you can see here, I just, you know, this has been a really good tool for me. It um, started in 2007 and um, has been a way to, really, if you look at this, it's actually a way to organize an ecosystem because everything is separate and yet they're all connected. And so there's so much stuff that goes into this 
if you're trying to organize a website or um, write a book or something, it, it's really complicated, but this is a way that I post stuff as it happens. And then uh, over time, it starts to build a sort of a library of all these different uh, issues focused around these, these four main um, topics here. So um, you can see, I just posted today, uh, here's Cassie uh, out at the river mouth uh, with this um, photo point monitoring station that uh, we installed with Dan and Katie from the uh, Ventura Land Trust. And the idea is you can go up, stick your phone in here or your camera uh, take a picture looking each way and then email that to Cassie and then the inbox gets uh, flooded with uh, lots and lots of pictures and over time uh, she can collect all those and uh, we will have <clears throat> that sort of an ongoing almost time lapse uh, database of what the beach looks like out here because um, if you look elsewhere on my blog you'll see how much the beach has changed and how much it is changing all the time so that's kind of a cool experiment um, so I'm going to go through, I promised that I would update on Surfers Point and Matillaha Dam, and then we'll talk about some other things. But I want to make sure that you guys, if you have uh, questions along the way, let me know. Um, and uh, I think, Laura, if you keep an eye out, somebody can raise their hand um, and or uh, type a question into the chat, then um, you know, I don't want to just be here, blah, 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 talking. If you guys, uh, you know, have things to say, let's talk about it. Um, so uh, if you click on this label cloud here, you can click on any one of these topics. And so if you click on Surfer's Point, uh, this photo point monitoring was tagged because that's at Surfer's Point. And then really, here's the latest news. And the latest news um, really that I'm aware of is that uh, the Coastal Commission uh, back in April approved the coastal development permit for the modifications to the Surfers Point Managed Shoreline Retreat Project. And for those of you who've been following along, you know that we've sort of built half of the project out there. Um, and that's because this original project layout, let me see if this goes big. There we go. So you can see here the plan was, this is where the pay booth is right now when you go into the uh, pay parking lot and then out here to the dirt lot. Um, and the original plan really was to move all the parking all down to the end here. So it would be all at the end and then in the back parking lot, the blue spaces would be um, overflow spaces. Um, and then after we built this, we didn't quite get all the spaces that we were supposed to here. So we kind of came up short changed, but um, it was clear that, you know, there was a lot of space here that people use a lot because you like to access the beach in this area. It made sense. And the fairgrounds was really concerned that they were going to lose parking um, if they were only to use this parking lot. Um, and so Actually, uh, at Surfrider, um, we uh, put in a proposal. Actually, um, Kevin helped me do a GIS analysis of how many parking spaces there were and how many um, spaces we could get if we maxed it out. And the end result, after it goes through a long political process with the fairgrounds and the um, Surfers Point Working Group, this was the new proposed layout. So you can see here now there's parking spaces base area. Um, they reconfigured back here in the overflow. So I think they get more spaces there. And then there's some other changes with the stormwater management and um, with the, uh, uh, the fencing and the entrance here. There's a lot of changes uh, that happened here to try and appease everybody's interest. But the idea is this whole area now will be sand and cobble just like it is up at the top. Um, and uh, parking that is out here now on the edge uh, will be moved back. And if I go back to this, I think, yeah, you, if you guys have been out there, this is, this is what it's looking like these days. I think if I, 
Paul, can you take a second to um, to really explain phase one and the cobble? People really, I don't think really all of us understand the the cobble that's underneath the sand. Can can you talk about that a little bit more? The engineering concept behind that? Yeah, I can. Um, and I wonder. I was actually just looking at some of these today. If I just look randomly, it's going to be hard to find. Here we go. See? That's that phase, that's phase one. Yeah, so this is the area where there used to be a parking lot right here. And uh, this whole area, this is where the, uh, the point, the real point where the main walkway goes out right now. And this was during construction. So this whole area, there's a 60 foot wide section uh, of parking lot and bike path that was all removed and then uh, it was excavated out. There was artificial fill and other material in there that was all dug out and hauled away or reused. Um, eight feet thick all the way wow. through. Then they came in and they put in cobble and then put sand on top of that cobble. So this is what's underneath that retreat zone. So you can see here, you know, I don't know, that's not a big picture, sorry. You can see trucks and trucks and trucks came in dumping sand and, and cobble. Um, in that retreat zone. And um, this is what it looks like up more towards the river mouth uh, where this was the bike path and parking lot right here. And this is in the summer when there's a lot of sand. So um, all that area was built, was excavated, filled with cobble. And then the bike path that used to come right here was moved all the way back to there. So that's what the retreat was. The managed part of it was that we were actually reconstructing and reinforcing the beach really with native type materials. It is the river delta is all cobble and sand that comes out of the river mouth. And so um, we were just using what would naturally be there anyway. Um, but that's a super dense, thick uh, berm of cobble back here. And you can see it was kind of sloped at the front edge and then flat on top, moving towards the back. And there's some other pictures. If you dig around on the blog, you'll find pictures, engineering drawings of that and everything. So that's what the retreat zone looked like. That's what managed retreat in Ventura looks like. And the idea is that in the future, when this area is eroded, um, all you will do is nourish the beach with more sand and cobble. And as the beach comes and goes, it'll naturally come and go. But naturally, instead of uh, when it's eroding uh, concrete and asphalt and rebar and all the other stuff you see out at the point, it gets, it gets pretty ugly. I mean, right now there's pipes and you name it. I think I got some pictures. Yeah. I mean, you can imagine this. If this was just sand and cobble, then it's just sand and cobble and it looks like a beach. There's a pipe here. This is a concrete curb. All of this is almost gone now. Um, and, you know, at high tide, it takes a beating. So, in, your, um, in your opinion, uh, are you attributing this erosion to the lack of the dam, right, to replenish, and then climate change? So you have these two, like, things opposing each other creating, am I right? Well, the number one issue here is, is inappropriate construction. Uh, you know, anytime you're near a hazard zone, you should have uh, an appropriate setback. So they should have had a setback here. Um, the local coastal plan, which the Coastal Commission requires local jurisdictions to have, uh, it originally um, required a 200 foot setback through this area, which would be all the way back behind, you know, into the fairgrounds, 200 feet. Wow. And uh, just uh, four years, three or four years after they approved that, the city and the fairgrounds came back and asked for amendment 
to accept them to be able to build what they call uh, coastal visitor serving amenities or something like that. In other words, a bike path and parking lot. Um, but they, they wanted to put it right on the edge. The interesting thing about that is that was before the chapter was formed, but the original environmental director of the Surfrider Foundation came up because uh, there's a whole group of surfers in Ventura that were concerned about this. And he testified along with others uh, over at the fairgrounds at a big public meeting in 1986, um, saying that it was gonna be built too close to the edge. Um, the Coastal Commission ended up approving the project, but they approved it with a condition and they often do that. They, they make conditions on projects. And in this case, they conditioned the project to say that uh, at no point in the future would hard coastal armoring, armoring be permitted, um, that this, was, this parking lot was intended and, and uh, understood to be temporary. Now, of course, you know, 20 years down the road when it's been there forever, it doesn't seem temporary to anybody. <laughs> and that's been part of the battle uh, that we've been going through. But uh, realistically, this was eroded uh, in 1991, just two years after it was constructed. So it, it immediately started seeing the impacts. And because of that no seawall clause, we've been able to hold back a seawall. Now, if we hadn't been there, there'd be a seawall there, I guarantee it. Um, but, um, and uh, proposing a, this proactive idea of actually moving stuff out of the way and trying to fix it and restore the beach. And to me, you know, that's, that's what kind of keeps me going and keeps me interested is the idea that um, you can actually go and undo a, a, a mistake, and you can fix it. Um, but the irony is, is that it's about 10 times harder to actually make a good project happen than it is to actually stop a bad project. So, you know, it took a year to stop the bad seawall from being constructed, but it took 20 years to <laughs> 15 years to get phase one built. So here you can see, this is an aerial, I went out and had Rich Reed take this for us. This is the existing condition with the, this is the phase two area and that's the phase one area up there. And the idea is that all of this gets moved back onto Shoreline Drive. And so this is the artist's rendition of what that would look like. And you can see here that that just, the sand here continues all the way down through here. So that was nice. The, um, the, the city put together this really nice aerial uh, graphic representation and we sort of tried to duplicate it with a drum. So you can see there's the, there's the concept for phase two. And um, as you guys know, we put out uh, an action alert to have people contact our state legislatures um, to try and um, allocate funding for projects like this around the state. Uh, I looked through the, the big budget that everybody was fighting over and there was nothing in there for beach restoration at all. There was coastal wetlands, but nothing for beach restoration. And um, we got several hundred uh, responses to that. Thank you everybody who, who did that. Um, that's what we have those real easy click and send type action alerts for. Um, and as far as I can tell uh, at this point, there is a large chunk of money that did get uh, uh, directed to the California Coastal Commission um, that will go out for beach restoration funding. Although, you know, in the next year or so, it wasn't a whole lot of money, but I think there was, uh, you know, several tens of millions that were allocated for it. So potentially there will be funding for this project, um, but uh, we need to uh, get organized and get uh, figure out a strategy and get the grants in. Uh, it's been hard while the fairgrounds has been upended by the pandemic and we haven't had working group meetings in person, actually haven't had a meeting at all since the pandemic hit. So things are still up in the air, but I'm optimistic that uh, we can find the funding to make this happen in the future. All right, I'll pause, see if anybody has anything to say or ask questions. So you have, I, I have a, actually have a question, go figure. I'm gonna like talk more. Um, so when you um, originally estimated how much it would cost, I was actually shocked because I didn't think it was a lot of money versus what I thought it was going to be. And now that you guys have stepped into 
the Coastal Commission asking for the electronic vehicle plug-in things. Does this create an opportunity for different funding for you? Because now you're like from two million to ten to ten million, right? Ish. Yeah, we did the first phase. Phase one was a three million dollar project, and now phase two is uh, ten. But you know, every year you wait, it probably goes up another ten percent or more. But um, you can now. You, can you connect actually to other types of grant funding? Because now you have environmental concerns or requirements like the electric uh, ch car charging things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's always a possibility. Um, for instance, in the initial uh, phase one, we used uh, uh, both state and federal money, and we got a federal transportation grant that was earmarked for uh, bike paths and and infrastructure for bike paths, and we got a state grant that was for, uh, from the Coastal Conservancy for Coastal uh, Access and res Restoration. So, um, you know, that's normally how you will do it is try and get, uh, get grants that match the other grants so that nobody feels like they're paying for the whole thing. But um, 10 million is a lot more than three. Yeah. Paul, I had a question. So I've seen a lot of, um, a lot of other counties along the coast doing a, a living shoreline. And I wondered what the difference is between how phase one was created versus what um, these living shorelines are being called. Because I know that gets thrown around a lot between managed retreat, living shoreline, but what you've done at Surfers Point is the managed shoreline retreat all in one. So I was wondering if you could just clarify what the differences are. Um, that's a that's a really good question. And for those of you who know Cassie, you know that she went to Cal State Channel Islands and studied some of this stuff. So that's where she's getting some of this from. Um, is that um, actually what happened was uh, there was a living shoreline program that developed. You know, over the years as we were developing this managed retreat thing, there there was living shorelines were seen really as a solution. Oftentimes in bays and estuaries where they were having shoreline erosion and they were doing things like building oyster reefs or uh, seagrass or uh, you know that type of thing um, to try and abate erosion in areas that had a lot less wave energy than we actually have here on the Pacific coast. So um, in my mind this is a living shoreline, absolutely. Um, and it has been termed as such. And I think it's a really good example of a living shoreline on uh, a high energy coast because you know these big swells that we get move things around a lot. We got the river mouth right there, super dynamic area. And um, uh, you know, this, this is uh, using the natural materials. It's, it's got the living dunes uh, and the whole system I couldn't believe after we built that, I was sitting out there and the vegetation had just started to come in and I couldn't believe I saw a rabbit in the dunes. <laughs> I was like, what, a rabbit? You would never see a rabbit at the point where it was all concrete and asphalt. <laughs> it's like, right. geez, this place is alive. <laughs> so yeah, it's a living shoreline. <laughs> yeah, it's worth fighting for. Honestly, the energy and dedication you have, man, it's worth, worth fighting for, for sure. Well, and like I said, I am really inspired by seeing positive change. I mean, I think there's so much, there's so much bad stuff going on in the world all the time that, you know, it, can, it, it brings me down, I know, but um, being able to see positive change, especially in your own backyard is, is, is a really powerful thing. And that's, I have that in my head. I know what it's going to look like. And um, I just, uh, that's what keeps me going on this stuff because I know that it's an easy solution. It's just, you got to get, um, uh, you got to get the politics aligned. A lot of politics. Welcome to our world, right? Yeah. Looks like we still got some more people coming in. Yep. Paul, this isn't a question. This is John. I just want to say you're freaking awesome. And <laughs> your period, full stop. And I'm like, <laughs> No, thanks, John. I appreciate it. And, you know, it's it's hard because you don't know how much of this people actually understand or care. 
um, as life goes on. And I just keep at this year after year. Um, I'm going to move on to Matillaha Dam now because this, I mean, if Surfer's Point takes 30 years, I don't know how long it takes. <laughs> Paul, Paul, before you move on, this is Julie. Oh, hi, Julie. Uh, Hi, it's great to see you. And as you know, I've always said we should rename Surfers Point Jenkin Point <laughs> for everything that you've done. Um, this that is going on now, is that going to help, you know, all that erosion that's happening now on the promenade and the cracks in front of the, um, you know, the condos and all that and all of that erosion that's happening there, is this going to help that going south? Uh, we'll have a lot more sand and cobble as the beach recedes. And so I think that will move down the coast to some degree, but um, there really needs to be some comprehensive planning on what needs to be done with the promenade and with the, you know, the emergency revetment in front of the free lot where we lost the palm tree. There's, there's a lot of issues. Um, and, you know, that is too close to the edge. That's on the edge, and there's there, there's not much room to retreat there. So, um, how that's handled in, under different sea level rise scenarios 100%. is going to be very uh, very interesting, and it's going to make a difference. I think with you know, say three feet of sea level rise, we're not going to be surfing that much in the cove, um, but up at the top at the point where it's retreated, I think we'll still be able to surf. So, you know, the coast is going to change a lot. Okay, thank you. Anything else? All right, I'm going to talk about Matillaha Dam now because everybody's always interested to hear the latest on that. Um, and if I just click on the Matillaha Dam, you know, tag in the cloud here, then all of the ones that are tagged Matillaha Dam come up. So it's an easy way to sort things. And by the way, if you look, like I looked to figure out when I started this blog, I had in my head 2009, but I can go back and look and. Honestly, the way my brain is these days, it's the only way I can remember anything <laughs> when it happened. And, and right? <laughs> oh my God. So it helps. Um, uh, so there, this uh, watershed mural you might have seen, we had to go out in a couple of our um, uh, newsletters. And this was a project that uh, somebody in Ojai, a uh, friend of mine, put together and uh, was really great, had kids come out and paint it. And they just put together a website so you can click on this. It's on the Once Upon a Watershed website, which is a watershed education uh, website. Um, and you can go through and click on, you know, different trees and birds and stuff. And it gives you a, a little um, tidbit of information about it. So um, it, it's interactive that way, it's kind of cool. But this was really for, uh, you know, uh, elementary through, well, I guess, high school uh, kids. A lot of, I think, middle school kids uh, painted this. Pretty cool. Um, but it just shows you how much energy there is in the community to take this dam out. It's very symbolic that they've got the dam here, the scissors in the stream, and a beaver dam replacing it. And so if you look elsewhere on this blog, you'll learn about beavers. But I won't talk about that right now. Um, on our uh, <clears throat> update, this is the big deal right now. I actually just um, drove by there today and they're going to town just in the last month. They've done a ton of work. Um, this is the bridge crossing the Ventura River um, where the Oakview Levee, it says uh, Live Oak Levee it's called, um, and this is in Oakview. And so this is where the river really pinches down narrow and the new bridge is going to be all the way out over here somewhere and add a, a third more width to the river to allow for greater sediment and flood transport during floods. And so these are always fun. Look at the, they painted these uh, shovels gold. <laughs> and we've got representatives from the county Department of uh, Fish and Wildlife. There's a county supervisor, Matt Levere and the public works director. And this is Sam uh, from the California Coastal Conservancy and myself. So um, that's fun, but this was a really big deal because we uh, wrote this grant and we got 13 to some odd million dollars to uh, replace this bridge 
You can see there's a sign up that calls it out as part of the Matillaha Ecosystem Restoration Project. So really this is the first big part of this big, big, big effort that we're underway. Um, and so, you know, in spring, we now have our public updates on the Matillaha Dam project twice a year in the spring and in the fall, um, hosted through the Ventura River Watershed Council. And um, uh, if you're interested in anything in the watershed, it's worth checking out the Watershed Council. And I think there's links on here to the Watershed Council. Um, and so, of course, this was still a remote meeting. So um, we did a, put together a presentation and this features uh, the bridge as our first big project. Um, but I wanted to show you this slide. Oh, it doesn't get bigger, sorry. Uh, this is about $24 million uh, this spring. I think we've raised more since then. Um, we are constantly uh, researching and writing grants for any piece of the project that gets ready to be funded. And there's a lot of different pieces to the project. So there's always more money that's needed. Um, and so you can see here, what really kicked off the project was a $3 million uh, planning grant through the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And all this money is going to the county to do the work, but um, this is what we call the 65% design planning project. And that's going back and re-looking at um, how the river might change with the new approach to dam removal and uh, what needs to be done downstream. And it's dragging on, it keeps getting stalled out because it's so hard to predict what the sediment's going to do County's really nervous about uh, what might happen. And so uh, there's another uh, more detailed sediment transport analysis underway right now. And we're looking at specific areas where there's specific issues. So um, this is where my background as an engineering comes in handy, as an engineer comes in handy, because this is all engineering stuff. But didn't you, could I interrupt you? Yeah. Sorry. So after the Thomas fire, there was more concern, more engineering studies about the sediment. And can you tell us a little, just a little bit about that? Um, I, I will talk about that in a minute. Okay. Um, but uh, the, the Thomas fire wasn't why they wanted to do more studies. Okay. In fact, I wanted them to do more studies because of the Thomas fire because I thought that was a great time to actually look at the river and see what happens when you get a lot of sediment coming down. Um, but it wasn't predicted, so it wasn't funded. There wasn't any money uh, for it. And there, quite frankly, wasn't a lot of interest because people didn't think it was that big of a deal compared to dam removal. I tend to disagree. But anyway, um, this is the big uh, thing here is our timeline, which, uh, does this go big? Ah. See, I think I put low res pictures up there intentionally or something. Um, so here you go, our 65% design uh, studies started, you know, 2017. It's ongoing. That's going to be extended a little. We're going all the way into the end of 2022 now with that uh, study. Um, and then hopefully uh, we've got some, we actually have this grant for final design of uh, a couple of the levees and the other bridge, um, and then looking for money to look at actually the final design on the orifices, which are the holes that we're going to drill in the dam. And then uh, all this infrastructure has to be built sometime in this time frame too, but hopefully somewhere in this time frame between 28 and 30, we will be able to flush the sediment out of the reservoir with a big storm and take it out. So um, this is a highly optimistic schedule and I try to be optimistic, but I, I keep seeing this timeline extend um, out every year that goes by. So um, we'll get there one day, but <laughs> I don't know, I don't know if, I don't know if I'd be around that long. <laughs> uh, Anyway, if you guys are interested in more information, uh, we completely redid the matillahadam.org website, which is the county's website. And there's tons of updated information on there, which is really good. 
as well as a lot of the historic information that I post on the blog here. Um, I was going to look down here. Yeah, I just wanted to show you this picture for those who aren't familiar with this or haven't seen this before. This is our watershed. This is the Ventura River watershed. And uh, the dam is right here, blocking off this sub watershed, which is Matilla Hawk Creek. Um, there's also a North Fork Matilla Hawk Creek that goes up Highway 33 over into Rose Valley, if you've driven up that way. But um, this is the main watershed that will be restored with access for steelhead and then all the sediment, a lot of the sediment that came down in the Thomas fire uh, will all be released with the removal of the dam. And that will flush all the way out to our river mouth where Surfers Point is. So we put this poster together, actually Cynthia um, did this. Cynthia is our GIS uh, guru that um, has done a lot of these great maps for us. So this, this poster, is on here, it's on the website, and it shows each of the project components downstream. So there's two bridges and two levees. And really the hardest part of this is gonna be this robust diversion, which diverts water over into Lake Casitas. And I have been putting a ton of energy into that in the last couple of years, um, trying to figure out how to resolve future impacts from sediment coming down from the dam into that from, from the Tillaha Dam into this small diversion dam. And we've got some ideas. Uh, we're actually just uh, hiring through um, uh, RLF, which is sponsoring a lot of this work. We're hiring uh, an outside consultant to take another look at the robust diversion and hopefully apply some of their expertise to it. So, um, there is a lot to talk about on Matillaha and I will stop here and see if anybody has any specific question. Yeah, Paul, this is Joan. Um, I think in a previous presentation, uh, it was mentioned that there was a concern about an invasive uh, tree species, tamarisk. And is that, is the, the concern about, I don't know how you prevent that from coming downstream um, but could you talk a little bit about that? Maybe other invasive species that are upstream that might be coming down? That is the perfect question because I just pulled up these images. Thank you. <laughs> um, the issue is that the Division of Dam Safety now is uh, requiring the county uh, or not allowing the county to store water behind the dam um, anymore. And so with that, last summer, they drained the reservoir. So I went up there and took a picture. They started draining you know, around the beginning of July. And you can see the way that it came and it cut, started cutting this through the reservoir. It's really interesting to watch the evolution of a stream like this through the sediment. And you know, rivers always meander and they cut away. And the whole time it's doing this, it's cutting slowly down through this fine silt and sediment. And it's moving that stuff downstream. So we started seeing a lot of uh, fine silt in the river downstream. But it's really cool. Like between this one and this one, you can see how that meander there had moved and migrated through this reach. Really cool stuff. I would have loved to have like a real time lapse of that and have it look like a snake, you know, just like carving through there. Um, it's going to actually do it again this year if anybody wants to set up a time lapse. Uh, they're they're actually just draining it now uh, in the next 10 days or so um, but this is the issue you can see that as that soil became exposed and this is all fine silt and clay um, but apparently there was also a lot of seed either from other tamarisks that it blew in or that had washed down uh, that was in this sediment and you can see things started growing and growing and growing, wow, and growing, um, and you know you would expect that nature ma nature likes to have ground covered. It's not going to leave any bare bare ground. But all of this light colored stuff here is that tamarisk, and um, the tamarisk is considered an invasive species in the American West, and uh, can get so bad it totally chokes out rivers 
just the way that Arundo has done up in upstream. And so uh, people got really concerned when they saw this. Um, and that's what that issue and concern was all about. And I'm not sure uh, what's gonna happen this year because they are uh, in the process of draining it again. And then uh, they're actually going to kind of put some stop logs to prevent the silt from flushing through, they think, they hope. Um, but I suspect we'll see the same type of scenario again where the creek cuts through the sediment and we'll get silty water downstream and we'll start to see stuff grow. Um, however, when, once I did more, a little bit more research and spoke with some experts uh, about it, uh, it seems that tamarisk does not do so well um, just getting flushed downstream. With a rundo, you can get a small piece of, of that bamboo looking stuff and it can go anywhere and re-sprout. Uh, it seems like tamarisk might not be quite as invasive, but um, I guess only time will tell. But yeah, thanks for that question. Um, but you can see it's pretty gross back there. Um, and this is what it looked like right, right as, after it was drained. So I went out and took a bunch of pictures. You can see how, how muddy it got, like between when it, when it was on the surface like that to when it started down cutting. Immediately, you could see that downstream. Wow. Obviously, it's moving, it's moving sediment. It's moving sediment, moving sediment. And all this, like I said, is really fine silt and clay. It just stays suspended in the water and just makes it, uh, makes it cloudy like that. Um, so yeah, if you wonder what I do, I go out and drive around and take pictures. <laughs> I went up and did this quite a bit during this period just to have this documented and, and that was kind of kind of useful. You can see how cloudy it got. Um, okay, so. So can I ask a question? Yeah. So a, a few like 10 minutes or so ago, you mentioned about a redirection that you're still trying to negotiate, like navigate and understand the engineering aspects of how you will do that. You are redirecting a small portion of like the minor dam. Is that what I understood? Uh, okay, so this is the, the roadless diversion. And I haven't done a blog post on this yet because the information has just been published and this new study is just getting underway. But the thing is, is the Ventura River flows from the mountains up here. When it comes downstream, uh, there's a small diversion dam here and that diverts water, surface water in this canal over to Casitas Reservoir. So it exists right now? Yes. Okay. It was built in 1959 when Lake Casitas was constructed and um, about a third of the water in Casitas Reservoir comes from this diversion. Wow. So most of the water comes from Coyote Creek and the watershed surrounding the reservoir. The river is a separate watershed. This is another sub watershed, just like Matillahaw Creek is. And so this Coyote Creek Valley is dammed by uh, the Casitas Dam. And so this is diverting water from the main stem Ventura River over into the Coyote Creek drainage and into the reservoir. And the problem is that uh, you can kind of see a picture of it. It's not a great picture. I've got some other pictures somewhere on the blog here, but um, the problem is it is a 15 foot high dam and it traps sediment just like any other dam. And so the problem is it currently has a problem. It got completely inundated after the Thomas fire and it cost a couple million dollars to clean the sediment out. Um, it was kind of always designed to do that, but it was designed to do that with Matillaha Dam in place, trapping the bulk of the sediment that was coming down from Matillaha Creek. So with removing Matillaha Dam, we'll get a bunch more sediment, even, even after the initial flush, there will be more sediment in the river, which is our intent. We want that sediment in the river. It makes for a healthy river, and then it makes for healthy beaches. But the problem is there is this other dam, the roadless diversion dam, that needs to be fixed so it can bypass that sediment. Wow. 
Does that, did that make sense? Yeah. I've never actually, I'd never heard of that. I wasn't aware of that. That's a big deal. It's a really big deal because right now in the drought, like Casinas is down, dropping down to 30% or so. And when it gets to 30%, then we go into, I think it's called stage four drought precautions and there's major cutbacks. Um, but, uh, you know, they're very concerned, obviously, about not missing any diversion opportunity. And they can only divert for uh, a matter of uh, weeks to a couple of months every year because the river's not flowing high enough for them to be able to divert most of the time. So it's really only in those wet years when the river's really flowing that they're able to divert uh, a lot of water. And at the same time, if it rains too much and they get so much sediment down that it comes down and it blocks their diversion and causes all kinds of problems. So yeah, this is this really is uh, one of the, the key issues uh, surrounding the dam removal and it always has been. The Army Corps project was designed around this diversion trying to not put sediment in the river. And we're trying to now figure out how to do it just by blowing holes and putting sediment in the river. So. Yeah, uh -huh. thank you. that's a good question. Thank you, Laura. Uh huh. I'm going to follow up Laura's question with um, another question. Do they have a place in anticipation of future wildfires or kind of a, a similar effect that we had with the Thomas fire? Because it seems obvious that we'll be dealing with more wildfires as years come. So do they, is there a plan out there for what they're going to do with a massive sedimentation event that would come from a wildfire? Something along those lines? Um, that's a good question, but it's it's really uh, not so much that the, the, the wildfires are the problem. It, the wildfires are, are really the norm historically. And if you look back historically, for instance, um, they estimate that at least half of the sediment that's trapped behind Matillaha Dam today came in in one big year, 1969. Wow. And there had been a fire uh, up in the watershed, um, you know, a few years prior to that. And then, you know, kind of the flood of the century hits and it erodes the hillsides like we saw in Thomas Fire and it all got trapped in the Matillaha Reservoir. And so it was shortly after that in, in the 70s um, that they had to notch the dam down. And so uh, that was kind of the end of really much water storage back there. Uh, but the point is that, um, you know, we live in a fire and flood environment. Um, that's going to ramp up for sure with climate change. I mean, you're right about that. Um, but that's really even more the reason why we need to remove the dam, fix the diversion, fix the levees. Uh, really what we have is a situation where we have old infrastructure that was designed for a completely different climate than we're going to see and for uh, a smaller population and we've kind of, uh, you know, patched things up over the years um, and we're not very resilient uh, when it comes to climate change, when it comes to drought and flood in the Ventura River watershed. And removing the dam here and fixing the diversion, like I said, protecting the communities that are in the river bottom is going to be critical um, as we see bigger floods and, and droughts in the future. Hey, Paul, this is Vince. Vince. So um, can you go back to your main um, front of your page? So perfect. OK, so a couple of shameless plugs for a, um, two works of, of film that Paul um, and the chapter were involved with. Um, one of them is Cycle Insanity, The Real Story of Water. Um, if you haven't seen it, I think it's really appropriate, especially since the city of Ventura is looking into hooking into the state lack of water system. Um, and also there's some talking about doing desal in this county. Um, it's important that we watch this as a community and it gives you a great overview of how ridiculous water is in this state. And the second one, shameless plug that that our chapter did, Watershed Revolution with Rich Reed, and, and Paul was in it, and Cynthia was in it, and some others, um, kind of gives you guys a good overview of what our Ventura's and Ojai's watershed really is and how 
we're trying to preserve it and all the work. Um, so those are two shameless plugs of two really great um, films that I think we were involved with. Man, Vince, I don't know if, I mean, we didn't coordinate this, but you're right on cue. Uh, that's perfect because I did want to move on to another topic, which is water supply. And I was going to say that these videos right here were created really to help, uh, you know, increase awareness of our watershed. I mean, when we started doing this in 2011, it's classic. If you watch the film, Rich went and walked down by the beach and asked people, what is a watershed? And people had no idea what a watershed was. Um, since then, I think our education has paid off and watershed is, I think, a much more commonly, well, maybe I'm just traveling in the wrong circles, but <laughs> a commonly understood term. And this, you know, we always talk about the water cycle. And this is how the water cycle has become the cycle of insanity. And this is where we waste, use and abuse the water that we have. And then we go and look far, far away to replace our supply that we've somehow uh, out, outlived. And so um, the cycle of insanity was really a collaboration between the San Diego chapter and myself um, in, with the Ventura chapter. They were looking at desal issues and I was really looking at how to integrate ocean-friendly gardens and groundwater infiltration and watershed management as alternatives to hooking up to state water. How can we be more efficient and capture more of our water here than have to look elsewhere? And so do watch these videos. This is really fun. I don't know how Surf Rider National hooked up with some really talented young animators. Um, and we had a celebrity uh, narrator. So that was, a, that was a, actually a pretty cool project. Um, yeah, thank you, Vince. I mean, I think you guys are all aware of the um, drought that we are currently in. And um, what's some of the things that are going on on the Ventura River. Um, a lot of the city of Ventura's water historically came from the Ventura River and still does come from the Ventura River. But um, uh, Santa Barbara Channel Keeper got really concerned when our stream team, where, as you know, we, we have volunteers that go out and, and monitor the river and look at water quality. And we started understanding that water quantity was, was as much or bigger concern even than water quality was. And this is at Foster Park, which if you guys know, it's about six miles up from the Ventura River mouth. Uh, it's a county park, but the city has a well field there too. And um, this is where, this is actually, there's a sort of a subsurface dam here that backs up the river behind it. And then usually it flows over the top. Usually the river's flowing here. Historically, the river was flowing here, but um, during the last drought, we saw it drying up and, um, uh, Santa Barbara Channel Keeper ended up um, having to sue to try and ensure that the city didn't pump the river dry. And there's a settlement now, they're like at three CFS or something, that's three cubic feet per second, how much flow needs to remain in the river. Um, this is significant because this stretch of the river historically was known as the live reach. This area from Foster Park up to Casita Springs is where water surfaces from the watershed above and comes up due to the uh, bedrock geology underneath. And, and Casita Springs, if you think about it, that's named for the springs that were there that the first people came and took advantage of. So um, this section that was the live reach, we could see it starting to die. And um, this is not unique to Ventura. This is happening around the world right now. Our rivers are drying up and um, it's, it's really a, a warning sign um, that this increased heat and drought is, is really going to be stressing our, our water supplies. So if you got a lawn, take it out. <laughs> Water, water's for bathing and washing. <laughs> Forget the lawn. Um, so uh, I wanted to bring that one up because this, this has been an interesting uh, process. Um, the most interesting part about it was that um, the city of Ventura actually turned around and um, 
filed a cross complaint, they call it, they basically sued everybody else in the entire watershed, hundreds and hundreds of people, anybody with a well or property that was over the aquifer um, was served notice for this lawsuit. Um, and the intent of that lawsuit is to try and do what they call adjudicate the basin. And that would look at all the water rights and figure out how much water there is and how much water there is to go around. And the city of Ventura is asserting that they're the senior water rights, so they get all they want and then everybody else can divvy it up. And that's kind of the way it's looking. Um, so it, it, is it from, so this is actually, you know, you could say the words, but the impact of what this, what is actually happening to the residents of the city of Ventura, it's ridiculous. So are you talking from a certain geographical point, Paul, to like from here to here, Foster Park to the estuary, or where is the jurisdiction of the city of Ventura actually suing the, the residents that use the wells? And does this include ag? Yeah. They're, they're suing everybody upstream and downstream. There's not so much water use downstream and that's not really the concern, but uh, their point is, which is not entirely wrong, is that, oh, there's no water in the river here because everybody upstream used it. And so there's hundreds of wells. I think there's 200 wells, more or less. There's um, more, there's more than 200. Yeah, and um, there's, uh, uh, a lot of agriculture and other uses upstream. There's golf courses and wow. uh, big, big giant lawns and stuff. And so, um, you know, somehow, you know, we need to come to grips with this and understand that uh, we need to uh, learn to live within our means and, and understand how important it is to protect our river because our river, when it's gone, you know, we're gonna be gone. Um, so does Channel uh, Keeper have the bandwidth to support what the city's counter suing? Oh, this is a David and Goliath. It is, it is very stressful. Yeah. Um, the city has hired the most expensive big, you know, water law firm in the state. And Channel Keeper has one lawyer on retainer. Um, but they do have background of experts. And I think the best part of the case, and really I shouldn't be talking too much about this because I'm not part of the case. I don't know that much about it, but I do know that um, uh, the state agencies, the state water board was, was co-sued uh, uh, with Channel Keeper on this, um, as well as the, um, uh, the, the Regional Water Quality Control Board there and Department of Fish and Wildlife are all party to this lawsuit now. So um, part of what this, lawsuit really was, was a public trust lawsuit. The state has a public trust responsibility to ensure that our waters are fishable and swimmable. And this is what the Mono Lake decision was based upon wow. a couple of decades ago, which if you're familiar, that was a groundbreaking, uh, often quoted, uh, you know, legal uh, case. Um, and uh, this one, you know, is, is kind of the same same argument. Um, but let me let me move on because there's a bunch of legal stuff that I'm not a lawyer, I don't know anything about. But I'm such a little tech weenie geek. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the Department of Fish and Wildlife put out um, some draft in-stream flow recommendations. So the other part of this is that Channel Keeper was arguing about how much water should be in the river there at Foster Park. And I think I just told you they were talking about three CFS. If you look at this, the California Fish and Wildlife came out and they're recommending in um, October, uh, November, uh, 16, 15, 24 CFS. And right now we have a settlement that calls for three CFS. So um, this is actually a lot of water. Um, and I tried to figure out where they came up with all of these numbers. And so if you're really interested in this, you can read my little uh, short description on this, understanding 
CDFW in-stream flow recommendations. I went through and took all of the data that was in a whole bunch of different charts spread throughout their entire document. And I pulled them all together into this one chart right here. And um, I'm not gonna bore you with too many of the details here, but I just wanna make a couple of points. The, the first point is that um, the basis for their recommendations are for uh, the type of flows that would need to be in the river to support habitat, primarily for endangered species like the steelhead, but also for other species that depend on the river. One of the things that has happened to rivers when they've been dammed and pumped and everything else is that um, the, the natural hydrograph of the river has been altered. And that can fundamentally alter the health of the river. It alters sediment transport, it, it creates algae blooms, all this other things that we're seeing in the Ventura River. So uh, this is what, we, what they're calling uh, functional flow. And um, if you look, the blue line here is what they're saying was kind of the historic natural flows in the river. And then the functional flow is what you would aim for, knowing that there's not that much water anymore, but that is something that would still mimic the natural processes enough to ensure that there was enough habitat there. So you can see here, the critical thing on the Ventura River is the dry season base flows, where the flows can get so low to the point that the river actually dries up, like I just showed you. And so maintaining those dry season base flows is what I'm really looking at um, in this. Um, but uh, the recommendations include recommendations for this fall pulse flow, assuming we get a storm in the fall before the winter comes. And then these are the big storms that you get in the winter. Um, you know, we have really high peaks on the Ventura River and then it drops back down to a, a low base flow uh, pretty quickly. Um, so this is a generic hydrograph. I went and went through all of the documentation and put in the numbers here that CDFW is recommending for this functional flow. So they're recommending, this is sort of based on historic, a 16,000 CFS 10 year flood event. Um, and at the same time, the dry season base flows, they're recommending uh, eight CFS, somewhere between two and 21 for this uh, functional flow. Um, Paul, they, what does CFS stand for? I'm sorry, I keep saying that. That's cubic feet per second. Gotcha. Um, I'm sorry. Ah, there we go. Um, yeah, when we go out and measure flows in the river, uh, it's kind of fun because you measure the cross section of the river and see how much water is going past that cross section and you can convert that into cubic feet and how many cubic feet are going past you every second. And so um, two or three cubic feet per second is, is a steady flow in the river, uh, but it's not much. Uh, 16,000 is bank to bank, muddy torrent with giant boulders rolling. And so that kind of gives you an idea of the range uh, of flows that we have in the Ventura River. So anyway, I went through and looked at this and I tried to figure out where the actual recommendations came from. And uh, the recommendations came from understanding what the passage flows for steelhead would be, the sensitive period, which is that dry period. Um, as well as what optimal flows might be for steelhead. And these were where a lot of these recommendations, that's where they came from. So it took me a couple of weeks to figure that out <laughs> and build a chart to explain it. But that was the only way I could understand it. And um, um, I kind of summarized that thing. So if, you, if you're into this kind of thing, you can go and read that document and hopefully my uh, little white paper here will help explain it a bit. The, the take home message here is that Department of Fish and Wildlife is trying to establish minimum flows for the river. And at the same time, we have SIGMA. SIGMA is the State Groundwater Management Act. And uh, this is, um, something that the CDF flows, CDFW flows will feed into as a recommendation, but this, uh, ground, this groundwater management is a whole new thing. And the understanding that the river 
flows on the surface are connected to how much water is in the ground underneath and around it and how well pumping can change flows in the river um, is really important to understanding, again, ecosystem-based management. And one of the things that Sigma has had the local groundwater agencies do is go through and develop a groundwater sustainability plan to understand how much water they can pump when and where and how uh, that should be managed to ensure sustainability. Um, and so uh, I got a little uh, concerned when I saw that they were kind of ruling out most of the river as a groundwater dependent ecosystem. And um, it doesn't make sense to me when a river is a river, this isn't like a big floodplain, I mean, a big uh, valley that is um, being pumped down. This is actually a river that's being pumped down. And so it, it has to be a groundwater dependent ecosystem. This, this diagram here kind of illustrates what that might look like where when the groundwater is high, the water in the river is directly connected. And then here they're saying that it could get down so low there'd be water in the river that's not connected to the aquifer. And in this case, you could pump as much as you want and it won't affect how much flow is in the river. The problem that I see on the Ventura River is that when the aquifer gets pumped down this low, the river's dry. So it's not, it's not disconnected, it's just disappeared. <laughs> it doesn't right. exist. And so I think there's a difference between a, a disconnected uh, aquifer and a, and a disappeared aquifer. So um, that's what this blog post is describing. And it goes through and these graphics are from the draft documents that the Groundwater Sustainability Agency just published recently. Um, and uh, you can, if you read this, you'll see I have some criticisms of their methodology because they're not actually following entirely correctly what uh, the Nature Conservancy has recommended that they do this uh, statewide. So this is really interesting stuff if you're into this. You can see here, this is a, a, a colored contour map of groundwater levels um, and how deep uh, they are below the surface. And this is kind of how that works. This is really interesting stuff. Um, and if you're interested, I uh, suggest you read this and you can actually go to the website and download a lot of their documents. Uh, another part of my criticism was that, um, you know, we have in our archives uh, a Ventura River Conjunctive Use Report from 1978. And at that time in 1978, they were actually suggesting, and this is similar to the model that we have today. This is the Robles Diversion we were talking. This is Foster Park down below. So this is the way the aquifer looks down the middle of the Ventura River. And there's wells in here that pump water out. And there's springs that come to the surface here. And um, this basic concept was, was understood decades ago. And at the time they had kind of suggested that there was a point where water levels dropped so low here that they weren't getting over to the springs and then the water level dropped here. And so that connection was not really being uh, adequately assessed in my opinion in the groundwater sustainability plan. Um, so, um, I think, I think that gives you an idea. I'm sorry, I'm skipping around so much. That gives you an idea of some of the stuff that we're working on, uh, that I've been working on on this for a long time. Um, all of this water management stuff is all part of this cycle of insanity, um, you know, integrated water management strategy that we started working on uh, about 10 or 15 years ago. And that's part of where the Ocean Friendly Gardens program came from, with the understanding like, how can individuals uh, get involved? What can individuals actually do? And it all starts at home. And being able to capture water on your property and infiltrate that into the groundwater or save it, save it in rain tanks, to use gray water to irrigate fruit trees on your property, so that you have a nice food forest and shade. 
Um, these are all strategies that scale up at any scale. So if it's your backyard or if it's your neighborhood or if it's the entire city or the entire watershed, these are the types of actions that we all need to be taking at every scale in order to begin to address some of these problems that are looming uh, bigger and bigger every day. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect presentation, Paul. Well, I think that we we really needed to like catch up and uh, <laughs> I couldn't think of a better speaker for our 30th birthday anniversary than you. Well, thank you for your kind intro. I Me. appreciate it. And um, thank you for all your work. Um, I, I can't believe that you host a Zoom and you were keeping us all entertained for like the first 10 minutes, 15, 20 minutes. That was excellent. So thank, thank you. you. And, You're welcome. Uh, uh, congratulations, Surfrider, 30 years. It's unbelievable. Yeah, you know, time goes by, but there's many, many players and there's so much contribution and so many um, issues that needed to be addressed along the way. And I, you know, because we're a volunteer run organization and a chapter, I feel like it's very important for us to really understand that if you want change, if you want to address an issue, I don't even know, like in when you thought of, oh, I'll want to contribute to removing the Matilla Dam. Did you just go, oh, what the heck was I thinking? because i could never take that on i would just go like five years in i'm like i hate all of you i quit but but just to be a part of this chapter and to be a part of the changes and the issues and the contribution and you know like like exactly like what you said earlier um it's a fantastic platform we've done amazing things since i've been in, involved with this chapter uh, it's amazing. And um, I don't feel like there's another nonprofit that you could be involved with in this area and be as successful. Uh, I've used it, you know, relied on being part of the chapter many, many times. And I've accomplished many things because of that. And I would encourage anyone listening here or anybody that you know of that wants to make a, a difference in an, in an environmental situation to really become a part of the chapter. It does make a difference. And Paul's a really great uh, example of that. You're amazing. Yeah, thanks, Laura. Thanks, everyone. Um, you know, I, I think, well, I'm not probably not going to make it to the big party. I'm kind of bummed. But I don't blame you. I get it. Well, I still I still have health issues and I'm, I don't have immunity. And so um, with this Delta plague, <laughs> I'm going right? to have to. So I think I'm going to miss you guys. But um, thanks for organizing that. It's great to be able to recognize the chapter. Um, we've had kind of one of these events every five years or so. The last one was the 25th, obviously. Yeah. And, um, those are always milestones that are, that are good, to, good to recognize. I really, really appreciate everything you spoke about tonight. It's fascinating. And the hydrology of it, the engineering of it, I don't, again, it escapes me. It's such on such a large scale, but it's so interesting. And thank you, Cassie Rogers, for the photo point monitoring post that's out there right now. And that was excellent, excellent. I can't even take all the credit for it because I was so inspired by, by what Paul does with his blog and the photos that I was like, oh, let's just set up a photo point monitoring post. And without Paul's help, I wouldn't have known where to put it. I mean, he, he helped tremendously with making this happen. And I just want to second everything Laura said. I mean, you inspired me. You were the first person I met that was like the face of Surfrider. And I was so excited to come to the chapter meetings and like meet the Paul Jenkin. <laughs> uh, it was, we watched all your films in the beach class at Cal State Channel Islands. And they are so important and so relevant. So Paul, I really, 
I can't thank you enough for all of you done. You can't ever leave us. It's not an option. You can miss our 30th uh, party, no. but nothing else. <laughs> so thank he's, you, Paul. Yeah, he's in it. He's in it. I love it. Thank you, Cassie. It's always, it's so good to see when others are inspired because it, it's hard to know what to do and where to plug in and how you can make a difference. And, um, you know, I think there's so many places out there that you can do that. It's just, it, it's hard to like, you know, figure out what you can individually do. And I remember I saw you out there doing your, your own little beach cleanup one day, you had buckets full of stuff <laughs> after I think one of our dune work days or something. So, um, yeah, that's great. Thanks, Cassie. Thanks, everyone. You're welcome. Thank you so much. I hope you guys have a great evening. Thank you so much for coming to the meeting tonight. This is recorded and we're going to put that up in the our YouTube uh, channel. But thank you so much, Paul, tonight for um, joining us and giving us the presentation. Thanks for the opportunity. And like I said, the blog is always there if you want more info. That should be like your hashtag. The blog is always there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll see you guys later. Bye. Thank you.